1930s, what a director was and what he did, they would have said he was nothing more than a hired hack, a little just above the lowliest of the low, which were, of course, the screenwriters, from whose figments of imagination the actual material came. Be that as it may, no matter the status of the director, no matter how much of a veteran or how experienced they may be, there are three key stages that every director passes through in considering and preparing their material. The first is to find the controlling idea of the material. In essence, the vision, the message behind the work. And here, a lot will depend upon the personality of the director himself or herself. It is not for nothing that the works of writer and director Woody Allen are cynical, elegant, dysfunctional affairs based on the relationships of middle-class white Americans. It is not by accident that we find the films of Martin Scorsese informed by bloodlust, revenge, ill-gotten gains, and occasionally redemption. Both men are infused by their earliest beginnings and by their outlook on the world. Next up, of course, is the visual style. Since we are to be regaled by spectacle, it is the director who has to choose where to put the action of the story. Of course, there are some limitations. It would not be fitting, I would argue, to set the noble battlescapes of Lord of the Rings in a dusty backlot in, say, Aradipu. <laughs> but the camera angles, for sure, are the domain of a film director, and every different beat must be measured and considered. You have to unify time and space, despite the fact that you are moving in space and yet putting the whole thing together in two dimensions. This, too, is the domain and the preparation of a director. And finally, of course, we have the casting of the material and the sculpting of the performance. Once more, the controlling idea is paramount. Consider Gone with the Wind, that well-loved classic. If the controlling idea had been merely a proto-feminist foray into the rights of women with the backdrop of the bloody American Civil War, I wager we would not have cast the enigmatic and um, immortal Vivian Lee as the fickle but charming heroine Scarlett O'Hara, which is, of course, the center of the film and the book. And yet the controlling idea is very far from that. It is much more akin to the idea that the, the glorious, legendary South had its decay and bloody rebirth and was uh, personified through the travails, the vicissitudes, the loves and the passions of this charismatic central figure, and which of course makes Vivian Lee a masterstroke of casting.